Welcome to Bringing Native Plants into Your Garden, part two, the beauty and power of locally native plants, presented by the Master Gardeners of Nevada County. I'm Chrissy Freeman, and I've been a Master Gardener since 2017. I've been gardening since I got out of college decades ago, and we took a, I took up native plant gardening in 2006, when we moved to Nevada County. With Darlene and Rita, I am also a member of the Redbud chapter of the California Native Plant Society, through which I have learned so much over the years about native plants. Darlene? I'm Darlene Ward, and I became a master gardener in 2011. My love affair with California natives goes back to camping in the Sierra and wandering the canyons of San Diego for many years. I planted my native plant garden when we moved to Nevada County in 2006, and I have been a wildflower docent at a local state park since 2008. I enjoy taking photos of native plants, and I never run out of new things to learn. Rita? Hi, I'm Rita Quaid. My husband Bob and I have been gardening for most of our lives. Um, we were part of the most recent Master Gardener class in 2019. Over the last several years, we've been enjoying exploring our interest in native plants since moving from Sacramento to Nevada County in 2017. Let's take a quick look at what we'll talk about in our program today. We'll begin by talking about what makes a plant a local native. Then we'll cover the special benefits of locally native plants. Then we'll continue by talking about local plant communities and how and why we design with local native plant communities in mind. Finally, we'll look at beautiful photos, photos of local trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, wildflowers, and grasses that work well in the garden landscape. Rita. Okay. A local native is generally considered something growing naturally in a particular county or plant community. They've evolved over thousands of years to live comfortably with the local critters, as well as the underground fungal network of local mycelium and mycorrhizae. A great way to see what might be a local native in your area is to check out Calscape and Calflora. We talked a little about those websites last week in part one of our presentation. The links will be in our handout. You can look up a specific plant and its growth characteristics and requirements, where it tends to grow well, and where you might be able to purchase the plant. Locally native plants are beneficial in many ways. Here's a locally native hummingbird getting nectar from a locally native columbine. Later in the season, the seeds will be eaten by other local critters. Locally native plants also provide benefits to us as gardeners as they tend to be easier to care for. They typically are drought tolerant and many species, once mature, need only minimal or even no irrigation aside from typical rainfall. They don't need a lot of pruning or pesticides or fertilizers and also can be more deer resistant than soft, non -tasty, uh, soft tasty non-native plants. They tend to be more resilient, so more likely to survive our climate and perhaps our less than stellar gardening abilities. Using locally native species avoids the introduction of foreign genetic material, helping to keep the gene pool local and more adaptive. Next. Local critters such as insects, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals have learned to live with their local sources of food, <coughs> shelter, pollen, nesting material, and breeding sites. Many insects eat only species with which they've co-evolved. Non-native plants might even be toxic to them. Local birds are part of the natural local food chain by munching on local insects and being munched on in turn by local predators. 
Recent scientific research has shown that in order for insect-eating birds to survive and thrive and to have enough nutritious insects to feed their hungry youngsters, they need at least 70% locally native plants in their environment. A mix of native and non-native plants is fine, but if you can, try to gradually increase the proportion of natives in your yard, up to or even exceeding that 70% threshold. Climate change is having profound effects on the world, with rising temperatures and shifting weather patterns affecting the ability of local critters to find food and to reproduce. The red-breasted sapsucker is one of our local species most at risk for extinction in our area. Every little bit that we do to help preserve habitat for threatened creatures will make our world a better place. Back to Chrissy. Have you ever noticed that you find some of the same plants growing together time after time in nature on your property or when you're out on hikes? Some grow together in the forest, others grow together on sunny dry chaparral, and there's a different group in the meadow. These are called plant communities. A plant community is what plant species grow together. We can think of habitat as where plants grow. It's a combination of elevation, soil, climate, compass orientation aspect, you know, is it facing south or whatever, and water availability. So a plant community is an association of plant species that's similar wherever that habitat repeats. That's why we see those communities in various places. A plant community has what's called characteristic vertical architecture. I found this fascinating and then it made natural sense. There's an overstory, there are certain plants in the midstory shrubs and understory plants. Different plant communities have different vertical architectures, which we'll talk about as we go along and specific species belong to specific layers. And a plant community fortunately is named after its dominant or characteristic species, which helps us as gardeners. What are the benefits of planting with plant communities, of gardening with plant communities? It's a natural way for you to group plants that have similar needs in terms of soil and water and light and drainage. So when you do this, you can more easily provide what your plants need. Also, the species support one another. The overstory plants provide sh shade for the understory plants. The understory plants provide cooling for the surface roots of the larger plants. It, it goes in a circle. The species support related wildlife so that birds of a particular species might take the berries from one plant and might use the, the, the old material from another plant to make their nests. So that means that we wind up with enriched biodiversity because more species can thrive in plant communities. And you gain a sense of place. You look around and you go, yes, I know exactly where I am in this place. In the broadest of strokes, we have five common local plant communities. The oak savanna, the chaparral, the oak woodland, the yellow pine forest, and the foothill riparian. We're gonna talk about each of these. And just to let you know that these and other plant communities are detailed in a book, Designing California Native Gardens, which is listed in our handout. In the broadest of strokes, the oak savanna tends to be more present at the lower elevations, and you'll typically find the yellow pine forest at the higher elevations. Here's the first page of a handout I put together for the Redbud chapter of the California Native Plant Society to help home gardeners craft landscapes based on plant communities. It's called Local Plants for Local Plant Communities. The link for downloading this is on the resources list for our workshop. You'll, you'll find that resources list um, on, the, webs on our, the Master Gardener's website with the information about the workshop. So 
you'll see that you can see for any plant, you can see whether it's an overstory plant and midstory plant. And then there's also a listing for the understory plant. See the botanical name, common name, and which of those five major communities that plant naturally occurs in. The oak savanna plant community, it's a grassland. It's dotted with widely spaced trees like this blue oak. Our local oak savannas may also have valley oaks or interior live oaks. The understory for the, as you notice, I went directly from overstory to understory. There tends not to be a midstory in the oak savanna. In the understory, dozens of annual species, of which these are just a small sampling, appear in the spring amidst the native grasses. There's the foothill poppy, the purple owl's clover, and the sky lupin here, but other frequently seen species include baby blue eyes, common media, and several local species of fiddle neck. Many native bulbs are home in the savanna as well. You notice this magenta, that's the purple owl's clover, it's what's called a hemiparasite, which means it takes some of its nutrients from other plants. So though seen here with just other annuals, it's more often planted with a perennial, which could be flowering shrubs or a native grass. Here's an example of an oak savanna plant community. There are perennials such as this mule's ear in a sunny location which can provide a little height variation above the wildflowers, such as those Western buttercups in the background. In the chaparral plant community, shrubs dominate, particularly manzanita, as on the left, and ceanothus, as on the right. These shrubs have tough leaves, often on the small side. These plants are all drought tolerant, generally with both long tap roots so they can access water deep underground, as well as shallow roots that can take immediate advantage of rainfall. Chaparral plants are quite fire adapted. That is, they need fire. Many species require fire or chemicals from smoke in order for their seeds to germinate. Coyote mint is an easy chaparral plant for the garden. It blooms vigorously for several months in early summer. It does have a bit of a brown period in the late summer through early winter, but it greens up really nicely. And it's a superb plant for butterflies. The chaparral plant community is particularly diverse, featuring 20% of California's native plant species, though it comprises only 9% of our land mass. This chaparral landscape is actually nature's handiwork, but wouldn't you just love to have something like this in your yard? It's just gorgeous. Rita. Okay, moving on to the oak woodlands. They're a little higher in elevation, around 200 to 2300 uh, foot elevation. While they still have lots of open light filled areas, there are more shrubs as well as trees such as black oaks, blue oaks, live oaks, valley oaks, and a scattering of ponderosa and gray pines. The acorns, <coughs> excuse me, the acorns from black oaks are a major food source for birds such as woodpeckers, jays, and turkeys, as well as mammals, including squirrels, deer, and bears. Native Americans learned to leach the bitter tannins out of acorns to make nutritious flour. Snowberry is a common shrub or vine in the oak woodlands. It can handle dry and moisture environments and can be good for bank stabilization. Birds such as quail love the pretty berries, but humans should avoid them due to very unpleasant intestinal toxicity. Bulbs such as these irises can live happily under oaks that prefer no summer irrigation. Grasses, including deer grass and perennial flowers like monkey flower and poppies, bring additional interest to oak woodlands. Next. And here's an open sunny space with wildflowers, including soap root and baby blue eyes. 
Going up a little higher in elevation, around 2,000 to 6,000 feet, we can find ourselves in forests of yellow pines, commonly known as ponderosa pines. This community might also include black oaks, as well as cedars, firs, and other pines. Elderberry is a valuable shrub that can be found in several plant communities. It does appreciate summer water and some protection against deer. Butterflies, moths, and bees love the flowers, and many birds and mammals feast on the berries. Humans transform the berries into syrup, wine, and medicine, and the stems can be made into flutes. Penstemon is also found in several plant communities. It's an easy to grow, long blooming perennial. Interestingly, the flower buds start out yellow, but as they open, they reveal a strikingly beautiful, otherworldly blue purple sheen. Hummingbirds, bees, moths, and butterflies enjoy these flowers. And here's another pretty grouping in a spot of sun featuring golden, goldenrod and coffee berry. Okay, riparian communities are found from low all the way up to high elevations wherever there are bodies of water such as streams, springs, and ponds. Big leaf maples shown here have glorious co golden coloring in the autumn. Other thirsty trees in this community include cottonwoods, alders, and sycamores. Mock orange is a deciduous shrub that will grow in drier areas but does even better in moister soil. The bright white flowers have a glorious fragrance and attract butterflies, as well as assorted gardeners. And here's another pretty grouping of plants for a moist area. And it's now Darlene's turn to tell us what we should know about non-local natives. Well, what about non-local California <laughs> natives? Some do have lovely flowers and other appealing features. And non-locals may be easier to find in nurseries. And some grow very well in our foothills and are able to highlight in our drought tolerant garden. However, there are some problems with non-local plants. They do not support our local ecosystems. They are not part of our plant communities and they do not enhance our sense of geographical belonging. They are not food sources for the larvae of our butterflies and moths, which means a lack of insects to provide the needed protein for baby birds. Some non-local plants may not thrive in our soil, climate, and elevation. When you're considering a plant, you need to look closely at its name to be sure you're choosing what you want. Is it a species, a cultivar, or a variety? Is it local? To grow locally native plants, you want to choose the straight species. This is the plant that is found in the wild and not changed in any way. Its scientific name in Latin has two parts, the genus and the specific epithet. Look at the name on the right. The species plant is Arctostaphylus baccari. We use the Latin name because common names may vary depending on where a person lives or grew up. The Latin name is the same in any language. If there is a word or a name following the scientific name, then you know it is a cultivar or a variety. In this case, Lewis Edmonds tells us it's a cultivar. Note that it has a single, has single quotation marks and is not italicized. The word cultivar means cultivated variety. The plant was cultivated by human intervention. It was selected for some superior trait, such as flowering, disease resistance, size, lack of thorniness, variegated leaves, or hardiness. The plant is often a hybrid or a cross between plants, although it may be a sport or a mutation. The seed will not come true. The plant must be propagated with cuttings or other vegetative techniques. Researchers are finding problems with cultivars. If the cultivar is planted near wild lands, the pollen may mix with the wild species, 
thus changing the genetics of locally native species. Ruffled or doubled flowers may make it difficult for pollinators to access pollen. Scent, nectar, and pollen may be changed in some way that's less appealing to insects. An unusual time of blooming may not meet the needs of local pollinators. Purple leaves are avoided by insects as host plants for their young, thus affecting the bird population that depends upon caterpillars for their babies. Purple leaves have anthocyanins, which are chemicals that discourage feeding. There are two additional terms to consider. The word nativar is a blend between native and cultivar. So it is a cultivar of a native species. Everything I've said about cultivars applies to nativars. The native plant was selected and may have been manipulated. It is grown from cuttings, not seeds. The horticultural industry will probably just say cultivar on the plant label. A variety is a plant that occurs in nature, but there is something slightly different from the others in that species. Since a variety is actually a species and is not manipulated, the seeds will produce the same variety. Notice the name under the photo. The variety is indicated by VAR, not italicized, and is followed by an italicized Latin word that usually describes something about the plant. In this case, glutinosum means sticky. Remember the Variety is italicized, the cultivar was not, and it had the single quotes. To summarize, look carefully at the name to see if the plant is a species, a cultivar, or variety. We may want to use cultivars to add beauty in the landscape close to the house, but most of our plants should be the species. If you can only find the cultivar to buy, Planting it is better than planting some exotic plant that is native to another country and has no relationship at all to our local ecosystem. Now we'd like to share some examples of locally native plants. Let's look at some examples. This manzanita is filling multiple needs for this robin. It provides cover for the bird, so it's harder to spot as well as a fabulous collection of berries. Let's start with trees. As with any landscape design, you decide about trees first when you do native plant landscaping, as these overstory plants will be the dominant element in the plant community you're aiming for. And they'll create significant shade patterns that you're gonna to wanna to take into account. Also, of course, they take the longest to establish. Dogwoods naturally are part of the riparian plant community. Like riparian plants in general, they require regular water. <clears throat> they may have four to seven petal-like petal bracts surrounding the tight bunch of tiny flowers. Pines are a tree type that is quick growing and easy, sometimes too easy. Our county has five local species of pines growing in oak woodland, chaparral, and yellow pine forest plant communities, depending on the species. This Doug fir evergreen gets very large, so make sure you have room for it where you might want to plant it. It has the most gorgeous cones. Look at those things. It's the host plant for many butterfly and moth species. It creates an overstory that can support a rich plant community of small trees, such as Rocky Mountain maple in the higher elevations of our county and shrubs such as ocean spray. The big leaf maple is one of my favorite local trees and it can work well in home landscapes. In fact, knowing that it's primarily a riparian plant, though also found in the yellow pine forest where I live, I planted one in the middle of my lawn to make sure it got sufficient water. Its bright autumn color is consistent and most welcome. 
black oaks are absolutely gorgeous and prolific in various parts of our county. And usually in the fall, they have dark yellow to light orange leaves. I was particularly intrigued by this tree that had these vermilion leaves. I just had to include it. The madrone is a relatively slow growing evergreen tree that's always attractive with its mahogany bark, white flowers, and red berries. Darlene. Hubs provide the mid-story level in the garden, and they are the backbone of the garden. Some shrubs may be trained into small trees, which is helpful if you have a small property. Flowers, leaves, berries, and bark can all be interesting. This plant is Ceanothus limonii, a mid-size evergreen shrub local to our area. Ceanothus comes in many sizes, from ground covers to trees, and there are many cultivars available. Our native white flowered deer brush and buck brush are both Ceanothus, and they often volunteer in our gardens. Flannel bush is also called Fremontodendron. It is an evergreen shrub that can grow to 15 feet tall and has large showy flowers. Flannel bush refers to the many small hairs that cover the leaves and stems, which can be very irritating when they get all over your clothes and skin. Plant it where you can, it can grow without pruning and it should never receive any summer irrigation. Nurseries usually sell cultivars and our native species only grows to about four feet tall and is rare in the wild. Toyon is another evergreen shrub, generally six to 10 feet tall. It has small white flowers in early summer, but most noticeable are the bright red berries that last all winter, providing food for birds. The plant is also called Christmas holly and legend says that Hollywood was named for it. It is abundant in our foothills and can tolerate garden water. Mock orange is a multi-stemmed deciduous shrub that grows wild in our mountains. The showy one inch white flowers have a fragrance and the leaves turn yellow in the fall. There are several cultivars available. Goose Creek with double flowers was found in the wild along the Smith River. Covalo has single flowers, much like our local native mock orange. Snowdrop bush is an unassuming shrub until it suddenly bursts into bloom with charming bell-like flowers. It grows in dry habitats in our foothills and it grows very slowly in the garden. It is deciduous and has round brown seeds that may be eaten by birds. Western redbud. In my opinion, every garden should have a redbud, or better yet, three redbuds. This is a deciduous shrub or small tree that is common in our foothills. The abundant magenta pink flowers, typical of the pea family, appear along the stems in early spring before there are any leaves. Rounded heart-shaped leaves emerge with a bronzy green color that darkens in the summer and turn yellow to orange in the fall. Dark brown seed pods hang on through winter. Native Americans use the stems in basketry. Western spice bush is a multi-stem deciduous shrub that grows natively along creeks. The bright green leaves look almost tropical and they turn yellow in the fall. The unusual strappy maroon flowers produce one inch urn shaped seed receptacles. The shrub likes moderate water, is fast growing and disease resistant. Oregon grape is the state flower of Oregon and is often grown as a flowering ornamental in our garden. It grows spontaneously here because birds have spread the dark blue fruit. Our local variety is called dwarf barberry. 
It is a small plant that grows slowly and may be seen in the wild along irrigation ditches and in pine forests. On both varieties, the leaves can turn red at any time as they age and the berries are edible but tart. Chrissy? Another type of understory plant are the perennials. The sulfur buckwheat grows naturally in oak woodland, chaparral, and yellow pine forest communities. They prefer sandy or gravelly soil, really good drainage, something I hadn't realized when I first planted them. I, and I'd long wondered why they remain stunted. Now that I know, I'll have to give them a better home. Hookeras, on the other hand, are definitely riparian plants. They love regular water and offer appealing color to partially shaded areas. Lupin, the eight lupin species native to Nevada County range from four inches to over two feet tall. They're perfect in pollinator gardens. They're almost all this uh, lavender bluish, a lavender bluish color but Darlene will show you later one that isn't. Our locally native monkey flowers bring months of color to the garden. The bush monkey flower on the right has more flowers, although they're both quite generous in terms of flowers. And the ones on the bush monkey flower are shaped like azalea flowers. That's one way to tell them apart. The California fuchsia is extremely attractive to hummingbirds in particular for its nectar because they're attracted to the red tubular flowers in general and you can't get more red tubular than the California fuchsia. They depend on each other. The species of plant depends on the hummingbirds for pollination and the hummingbirds get most of their nutrition from the nectar of this species. The California fuchsia blooms at the height of summer for a long period. Shown here, uh, you can get either the California fuchsia as a uh, pure species, and there are many varieties also available. The Western Columbine is part of several of our local plant communities when afforded some water and some afternoon shade. It blooms for several months in late spring and early summer. It brightens any color, any corner of the garden. The woolly sunflower like well-drained soil. The Siskiyou nativar shown here also likes a bit of afternoon shade as its name implies because it originates in the far north of our state. Milkweed has exploded in popularity in recent years because people want to support monarch butterflies, which need milkweed on which to lay their larvae. It's important, however, to plant only locally native milkweed. Otherwise, the monarchs will stick around as long as those non-local milkweed remain viable. Then they won't have enough energy left to complete the generations needed in order to reach their coastal overwintering sites. So their offspring won't survive. Listed here, are our locally native milkweed. Of these, the narrow leaf and the showy are the easiest to find for sale, and the heart leaf is the hardest to grow. Here's our narrow leaf milkweed with a monarch larva. Look at that caterpillar. In 1997, over 1.2 million monarchs were reported in California. In 2017, the count stood at only 200,000, and it's maintained that level for recent years. But this winter, fewer than 2,000 monarchs were counted in all of California's overwintering sites. The rapid decline of the monarch butterfly in the past few years and the drop off to extinction levels in California are not yet well understood. Loss of habitat could be a major factor. Some research also suggests climate change or rise in carbon monoxide levels could be a factor. And here's the taller showy milkweed. Both species bloom for a long time and they help us do what we can for the monarch butterfly.
Rita. It's a good idea to leave some of your garden unplanted to allow native ground nesting bees to make their homes. But if you do have a blank space that you choose to spice up a little more, consider adding ground covers. Dicentra prefer, prefers moisture, richer soil, and some shade, spreading via underground horizontal tubers. Bleeding hearts were among my favorite flowers growing up back east, and I was delighted to discover that California has this beautiful local native version. Sonoma sage, also known as creeping sage, is a tough spreading plant that can handle shade and poor soil and can do well on dry slopes. It needs good drainage and only infrequent watering. The pretty white flowers appear June to September and attract bees, butterflies, and birds. Many sages have a delightful spicy fragrance that human noses can appreciate. Referring back to Darlene's discussion of cultivars, this Bees Bliss version of Sonoma Sage has bluish purple flowers instead of the white flowers seen in the previous slide. If I were a bee, these blossoms would make me quite happy. Wild Ginger is another great ground cover for moisture shaded areas. It spreads via deep underground rhizomes to form a green carpet of heart shaped leaves but you won't find its flowers easily. The unusual maroon and white flowers are kept hidden under the leaves. They have a somewhat unpleasant odor that is attractive to the little flies that pollinate this plant. Darlene's garden includes this attractive grouping of bleeding hearts and wild ginger. Aristolochias are found on many continents and can exhibit bizarre flower forms. Here in California, our local Dutchman's Pipe is a winter deciduous <clears throat> vine growing to about 20 feet. It enjoys trailing through adjacent trees and shrubs. While it can handle a somewhat dry location, it is happier with some summer water. It blooms late winter to early spring with these odd flowers. Being in the same family as wild ginger, the flowers have a rotting odor that don't smell too good for us, but attract flies and gnats needed for pollination. A particular benefit of having a Ristolochia in your yard is the possibility of attracting the beautiful pipe vine swallowtail butterfly, shown here on the right, resting on a blue dig's flower. Pipe vine swallowtails are very particular about where they lay their eggs. Aristolochia happens to be a preferred host plant. If you're lucky, you might find one day that your vines have been stripped bare by the striking orange and black hungry caterpillars that devour the leaves and even the seed pods. As they eat, they absorb chemicals from the plant that make them taste yucky to predators, and that increases the chances that we might get to see even more pretty butterflies in the future. Darlene? I wanted to talk about Roger's red grape because it's one of my favorites. In 1983, Roger Rage, Rage spotted glowing red flower leaves among the yellow leaves of the native California grape in Sonoma County. He took some cuttings back to the UC Botanical Garden where he worked. Everyone was impressed with Roger's red grape but some people questioned whether it was truly a native plant. Finally, in 2009, DNA testing at UC Davis confirmed that it was a hybrid of the wild grape with a European wine grape cultivar, Vitus vinifera alicante boucher, which was used to add red color to wines in the late 1800s and in the depression. Rogers red is spectacular in the right place, but it can grow to 40 feet if left uncontrolled. It can be used as a ground cover or on a trellis. The grapes are like Concord grapes, but smaller, and they can be used for syrup, jelly, and grape juice. They are too seedy to enjoy as a table grape, although I snack on them when gardening. Birds love them too. The next category will be bulbs, rhizomes, and tubers, which fill the understory. Blue-eyed grass is an iris, not a grass, 
It grows up to 7,900 feet throughout California. The plant is 12 inches tall with three quarter inch flowers in the spring and it goes completely dormant in summer. Sierra fawn lily and la fairy lantern are a lovely surprise along our foothill trails in the spring. The Sierra fawn lily has white flowers with an egg yolk yellow center. Its name comes from the fawn-like spots on its broad leaves. A plain leaf fawn lily grows at a higher elevation. The pearly white fairy lantern is breathtaking when it is backlit by the sun. The flower looks delicate, but the tough bulbs like to grow in rocky locations in shady canyons, especially in our lower foothills. Bowl tubed iris and another one are the two that grow in our area. The bowl tubed iris grows below 3000 feet elevation. The Sierra iris grows from 2000 to 7,600. You can choose the one that is appropriate to your elevation. The Humboldt lily is not very common, but it is a delight when you see it. The plant may be three to 10 feet tall with whorls of green leaves on the single stem and multiple flowers nodding at the top. This plant grows in dry soil while the similar leopard lily grows in moist places. Planting seed is an option, but it will be up to 10 years before the plant will flower. Blue Dix and Ooh Cow are both frequently seen in grassy areas, waving in the wind on top of two to three foot slender stems. Blue Dix start blooming in late February and Ooh Cow blooms in April. So that is one way to tell them apart. Blue dicks also have purple bracts under the flower cluster, while Ooh Cow has a looser head and the flowers have a constriction in the floral tube. Native American children dug the corms to eat, calling them grass nuts. Sierra Foothills Brodea blooms in June later than the previous two. The funnel-shaped flowers are in a spreading umbel. It only grows in Butte, Yuba, and Nevada counties below 3,500 feet elevation. I knew of two locations in Grass Valley, but unfortunately, development has decimated them. You can see them at the Black Swan Preserve near Smartsville. If you are tempted to sow wildflowers, you can find instructions online. You can buy seed for individual wildflowers that you know are local, or you can choose a wildflower mix that is appropriate for the foothills. Mixes often include five spot, baby blue eyes, tidy tips, globe gilia, clarkia, and lupin. Five spot will reseed easily, while baby blue eyes does not reseed reliably. Bird's eye gilia may be abundant on open grasslands and hillsides below 4,500 feet. It grows up to 15 inches tall and has remarkable blue pollen. Western blue flax is found up to 9,000 feet and is found throughout the Western states. It looks delicate, but is very tough and will grow in coarse soil. The whorled flowers of Chinese houses are a favorite of many people. They grow natively in shady grassy places below 3,300 feet. They can reseed themselves, but have not done so in my meadow, even though I place them at the shady edge. Chick lupin has reseeded enthusiastically. It is often in wildflower mixes and it's also hydroseeded along highways. Locally, we're more likely to see blue lupin. There are many species of Clarkia, but not all grow in our area. Flower colors and shapes vary, but they all grow in openings in full sun. Wine cup Clarkia can be four to 24 inches tall, and it often has a dark spot on each petal. 
The next picture is an early spring picture of my dry meadow on our corner lot. Five spot and baby blue eyes start growing with winter rain and are the first to bloom near the end of March. However, baby blue eyes gradually faded away while five spot has spread all across that area. I learned to recognize the baby plants and I try to remove any weeds before they take over. This is the same meadow in late spring, including California poppy, chick lupin, and seaside daisy, which is a perennial from the coast. They all attract a lot of pollinators. As the poppies fade, a stand of showy milkweed grows tall and slender milkweed appears here and there throughout that, that uh, meadow area. The final photo is in the fall after I remove the spent wildflowers and let the perennials shine. The shrubs and trees glow with autumn colors. When the rains come, the cycle begins again. Grasses are the final part of the understory picture for plant communities. Grasses can be easy, attractive elements in native gardens. They naturally grow in meadows and under oaks in woodlands. Though Nevada County has an amazing 93 local species of native grasses, most of the time when we see grasses on hillsides or in wildland, we're no longer seeing native grasses. They're threatened by invasive non-native grasses. Natives co-evolved with local fauna, which eat them as needed. But European grasses, mostly imported inadvertently in hay bales or on cattle hooves, are not part of the local native ecosystems. So fauna generally eat them less and thus they become dominant. So we can bring back, help bring back the native local grasses. We can use them as a featured plant for shape. They're beautiful in a landscape that way. Or used at scale, which is to say, you know, three, five, seven, a group. We can create a sense of color. We create motion as the tall awns blow in the wind and habitat. Many insects and small reptiles like the native grasses. And the birds, of course, love their seeds. The deer grass is our largest locally native grass. It works really well as a specimen plant in a row or otherwise in a grouping. This grass wants a haircut only every couple of years or so, so it's pretty low maintenance. This is a meadow in, uh, at our house about seven months after we started it from plugs. And the tallest grass in the foreground here is called June grass. On the left in the back is Idaho fescue, which is a neat and tidy grass. You can see you, get, you can get different effects depending on the grass you choose. If you're doing a larger area like this, rather than a few plants, you can start grasses from seed or from the small plants called plugs, which cost a lot less than a one gallon plant. The advantage of seed is that it's relatively inexpensive and easy to ship. The downside, is that it's difficult to differentiate between tiny native grass seedlings and grassy weeds until the weeds are well established. Plugs tend to start easily, but you may have difficulty finding a source that doesn't have a minimum order that's the equivalent of like 150 plugs. Sometimes they're available at native plant sales. That concludes our presentation. This quote here sums up what we have been thinking and feeling as we have put together this presentation for you. Growing a natural habitat garden is also one of the most important things each of us can do to help restore a little order to a disordered world. Thank you for coming. We're so glad to share our love of native plants with you. We've We've, we are now wanting, we would like to remind you that the program handout and recording uh, will be 
on the Nevada County Master Gardeners website, which is up there, ncmg.ucanr.org. The handout is up there now. The recording will be up there in a little while. And now we're ready for your questions. I have a question about, um, Lisa asked a question about the oak savanna being at two to 3,000 elevation and then getting up to the yellow pine forest. It sounded like you said 6,000 feet. I'm not sure if, if you said that, but we wondered on that elevation and also um, mixing more than one plant community in a single garden area. Okay. Um, the yellow pine forest, Rita, you have that information, right? Yeah, there are um, various elevations listed for various resources. So uh, the yellow pine, uh, I saw resources say anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 feet. That sounds about right to me also. I live at 2300 and I live in a yellow pine forest. So I know it's true. So those two, those two um, plant communities, the oak savanna and the yellow pine forest, um, they can share what's called an edge, which means there are plants from both plant communities kind of intermixed at the place where those plant communities uh, come together. And actually, just as a sidelight, um, in nature, we observe that edge communities where there's a little bit of both because they're, it's changing from one plant community to another. Those are particularly rich environments in terms of biodiversity. One of our friends asked, which native would you recommend as a sunny spot for a ground cover that has thorns or perhaps other deer type repellent so they could resist that deer pressure? Can you think of it offhand or I know it would probably be in your handout. The handout doesn't talk about sunny or shady. So for that, uh, the, our suggestion would probably be to look at the plants that are understory plants for the plant community that you're going to be working with and then look up their, uh, their landscape characteristics, uh, their, their light needs on Calscape. And that, that's the, that's one part of the answer. Uh, Darlene, what comes to mind for you? Well, I was thinking, first of all, I wouldn't try to use um, a ceanothus with a large leaf because the deer tend to munch on that. We have used ceanothus with a small leaf as a ground cover. However, there are no thorns that would repel deer. So I don't know how that would be. Um, also a very thorny plant from Southern California is the shrub, the fuchsia flowered gooseberry. And I use that as a deer deterrent. It can also be a human deterrent because it has three sharp spines at each node. Still, I'm thinking around this whole topic, a sunny area, you wanted it with thorns, right? To um, that's what the question was, yes. Yeah, I, I can't think of one right offhand. I'm sorry. Well, I, I think it's a really intriguing idea. Um, one thing that I have in my yard that the deer absolutely do not bother that I think over is, um, it's called coyote, coyote brush. Um, it grows to maybe one or two feet. It's filled, absolutely filled with little teeny button yellow flowers uh, for months in the summer. And it forms a really, really dense, dense uh, ground cover that I think the deer would find um, something they wouldn't want to walk on. They would feel that their footing was insecure. And that's in full sun, absolutely full sun and requires no supplemental water, you know, once I got it established and it, it gets somewhat larger. You know, I started with, with one plant and now, you know, 14 years later, I have something that's, you know, 
10 by 15 feet or something like that. I mean, it's really substantial. Uh, Chrissy, I'm wondering if that is the one that's not native to our area. It actually is. You're right. It is the it is the the cultivar uh, pigeon point, but you can also use the native variety, which has I think white flowers, right, Darlene? Well, our native coyote brush is a large shrub. Oh, okay. Very well, attractive to pollinators, and if yes. you the that it comes in male and female forms. Um, I'm trying to think which it was now that spread the seeds so widely. I must have had a female form because I kept getting volunteers everywhere. You know, one thing you also might think, I don't know what you're trying to protect, um, but um, the, the creeping barberry, the dwarf mahonia that we showed earlier, it's very thorny. Um, it does like a little bit of shade. So if you had an overstory plant that would provide it with just a little bit of shade, uh, I think it might do really well. It's a very happy plant um, in that, that seems to uh, come up uh, and stay low and um, do really well. So I have one last question. It, the question sort of has to do with um, welcoming insects so that birds will have food for their young and creating that habitat, but balancing that with wanting to keep insects from damaging my plants. I, I think we've, we've all wondered about this. It <laughs> is a, a quandary for gardeners, um, but on balance, I've decided to go pro, pro beneficial insect. Uh, one thing that I want to do is learn more about uh, insect ID. And in failing that, you can always send a picture to Master Gardeners uh, under Got Questions and find out the species of insect that you're noticing. Uh, I, I myself had a really fascinating experience at watching an ecosystem at work a couple of years ago. I had uh, some of the, the native uh, creeping sage that Rita shared, and it was starting to get cut, and it was, it's kind of a large patch. It was starting to get pretty infested with aphids I discovered. And I thought, oh, what am I gonna do? And I thought, well, I had the meadow uh, that was just kind of across the driveway from that. And I had over the winter seen ladybug larvae in the meadow and I thought I'm just gonna wait and about a week later there were lots of ladybugs where the aphids were and about a week after that there were no more aphids so I, I know this is it, it's a true though idealized story yes exactly and I love the concept of what you're saying is to just calmly wait let nature do its thing. I sure learned that after two years in my yard where the pesticides that the previous owner had used were really going away and boy, the beneficials came in like gangbusters. Two resources on that. We do have a, an upcoming workshop on beneficial insects and welcome, welcoming them to your yard. And then of course, insect ID is a biggie on that and our website has that as well. So it's a really good question to me. It just feels better to have all those beneficial insects rather than pesticides. Looks like we're almost out of time unless you three would like to add something. I know the radio show starts, well, four minutes ago on KNCO, but unless you would like to ask other questions, I'll hand it back to Sylvia. Well, I had one thing to add, if I might. Yes, thank you. Last question. Doug Tallamy dealt with that too. He said that uh, the insects probably won't damage the whole plant and that the casual observer is not standing on top of your plant looking. If you just step back a few steps and look at the overall shrub, you don't pay much attention to the fact that there's a hole here or there. So I thought just to add that, uh, don't panic if there's some damage on your shrubs. It's perfectly acceptable. I'm here and I am going to um, pose one question that came to me directly. 
um, for our presenters. It says, can you recommend native plants for an area with an ephemeral stream slash wetland from winter drainage that comes from along our local road into our front yard? So again, native plants for an area with ephemeral stream slash wetland. Immediately spice bush comes to mind. It likes to grow along areas where there are, it has been moisture, but it doesn't grow right in the water usually. And um, the snowdrop shrub or bush is also a riparian forest plant. It grows along the banks of rivers like down at the South Yuba. I hear what you're saying about it being ephemeral. So you're going, okay, so we get, we get water in the spring, but we don't get water in the summer. You know, what, would, what would be happy in that kind of environment? I think Darlene's choices are really excellent. Um, I, I think that uh, ribes species um, don't, don't need summer water. And one of the nice things about them um, is that um, if, you, if they have more summer water, they go longer before they go dormant. But then if they go dormant, they go dormant. So, uh, and then they come back again in the spring. So that, that might work really nicely. Um, I'm, there are two other things I might think about, and Darlene and Rita speak to this if you, if you have a thought. Um, if you have an area where plants can expand and you don't need to worry about, you know, how, how that they might keep expanding, um, bracken fern is a fern um, that grows readily here. Um, it's a local fern. We have actually, I'm going to say like 14 species of ferns that grow uh, locally in Nevada County. I could be off by the, on the number, but that's about it. And um, they'll go dormant and then they'll come back again when it starts to rain. And the other thing I was thinking about was um, like columbine and also, um, well, those two. What do you think, Darlene? Rita? Well, I'm thinking bracken fern isn't it usually more on the dry flo forest floor? Yeah, maybe a little, but it, it, it wants a little water. Anyway, I'm, I might try a couple different ferns and see if you get one to stay, to stay, you know? Well, and I also would just suggest taking our list, looking up some of the articles, doing a search online, just you know, looking around because various books and various uh, authors will list plants that grow in the shade, dry shade, moist shade. And, and you know, plants that live in, that are native to riparian zones up here that are locally native to riparian zones um, are adapted to having there be significantly less water in the dry months of the year. So I would recommend starting with the Foothill Riparian plant community and looking at those plants. Aha, uh -huh. that brings to mind elderberry. <gasps> it likes to grow yes. where there's moisture too. Yes, yes. And the another thing you can do if you have an ephemeral stream is think, depending on if you have a place not too far away, like maybe 15 feet away, that's sunny, um, is to plant a Fremontid dendron because the Fremontid dendron likes no, um, no additional summer water once it's established, but it does best when it can reach its roots out to some water source. So you might also look at plants that like no additional summer water that you could plant a little bit away from that ephemeral stream area, but that would really appreciate its presence. I did get one more question. Paige asks, is it fair to assume that our 10 acres at 2,600 feet on top of a hill can have multiple plant communities? The whole property has black oak, live oak, 
ponderosa, doug fir, incense cedar, and a few sugar pines. But the south side has lots of manzanita, and the north side does not. So, absolutely. The first community you described is I would I would call it a yellow pine forest. Um, even though there are many, and, and as, as Rita mentioned, there are lots of species, tree species besides the ponderosa, but that diversity um, is not atypical of a yellow pine forest. It sounds like you have a wonderful property. And then the other property that doesn't, you know, that has manzanita depends on what kind of manzanita it is and are there trees growing above the manzanita? So if the manzanita is the highest part of the vertical architecture, then that might be more chaparral-like. If there are still the yellow pines above the manzanita and still oaks above the manzanita, then you're probably still in yellow pine, but you might think about putting you know, drier plants on you know, plants that do better in dry, in dry conditions on the south facing side and plants that like a little bit more shade and a little bit more moisture on the north facing side. That's a great answer. Paige also made a note after that and you're right. <laughs> Chrissy, I think this sounds like a beautiful piece of property. It, she says they also have lots of Kit Dizzy. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation and Sonoma Sage and then some low growing Ceanothus. So, <sighs> Yeah, it just sounds beautiful. And those have worked for so I wanted to mention that. And to also have a sugar pine. Often they grow at a higher elevation, but I quickly grabbed the Redbud Shrubs and Trees book. It says it can grow at 1,500 up to 6,000 feet. Yes, it's a beautiful piece of property, it sounds like. And you can have multiple plant communities. Which and, if you also have, and if you have a piece of property like that, that, since you have a piece of property like that, that has a really lovely array of um, naturally occurring local native species. Um, and if you really want to figure out, you know, what, what you want to do as far as plants and all of that, um, do pay attention to our, uh, the redbud California Native Plant Society's website. We are updating the gardening section and we expect to have the update up and ready for everybody to see by the end of March. And um, there are many aspects of the website. It's a beautiful website now. I take no credit for it. Uh, oh, well, I mean the gardening section when it happens, but uh, the rest of it. it uh, and uh, I think you'll find that there's uh, information that you would find really valuable. And come join us uh, formally or informally. And I think you'll find it a really lovely experience as you work on your property. I think we're done. Mm -hmm. okay. Get out on the trails and see the wildflowers. Find out what kind of year this is going to be. Every year they're different, depending on how much rain we've gotten. Some of the wildflowers prefer hot, dry weather, some of them like a lot of rain. So come and see what's going on. All right, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you presenters once again. And I will end our presentation now of bringing native plants into your garden. We'll see you next time.